Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I don't know about you, but um, there aren't many people I'd rather spend the beginning of a very long bank holiday weekend with than you lot, so, um, and Meng Zing. So uh, well done for making it out on, on this wonderful occasion. Um, my name's Anthony Bull. I'm head of the Department of Bioengineering, and I'm just, I'm just um, stopping you from the main event, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, uh, for this wonderful occasion, the inaugural lecture of Professor Meng Xing Tang. Um, I'd like to particularly uh, welcome here today Meng Xing's family, Lee, Jack, and Leo. Um, I gather they've already had a foretaste of this lecture. So they will the ones who, they're the ones who are going to be able to answer all the questions afterwards. Maybe. Um, and of course, um, the wider bioengineering family, um, the, uh, the wider family of Imperial College, um, ultrasound researchers in the UK, I see a few around. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to welcome you here. This is a family occasion. Um, and, uh, but before we can just have the party and we can have our bubbles outside, um, we're going to make Ming Zing sing for his supper. Um, although because he does it in the ultrasound frequency range, we won't hear his singing. Um, Ming Zing joined us at Imperial in 2006. Um, he had been a, uh, a lecturer, college lecturer and postdoc at Oxford for four years before that. He had finished his uh, PhD from De Montfort University in 2003 um, on, a, on a scholarship. And ever since he's been here, he's been a colleague who has not only excelled in his research, but he's excelled in so many other ways. Um, and it's up to me to sing his praises in some of those other ways um, here now. Um, he's an impressive academic. He, um, unlike many of us, has had this wonderful continuity of research funding, which has allowed him to not only do his fantastic research, but provide and support and mentor people in his research group, which he does uh, brilliantly. Um, he, um, his work in the technical area of ultrasound, um, super resolution, for example, is something that will come up, but is also in the areas of application areas, you know, for example, in, in cancer and um, blood flow imaging, and I hope these examples will come out later on. Um, cancer engineering has been a major area for the Department of Bioengineering and for Imperial College, as we've tried to work together with the Institute of Cancer Research and done so effectively. And Meng Zing led for many years the initiative at the institutional level for that, bringing engineers together with uh, our cancer researchers, uh, and did a fantastic job on that. Not only just a fantastic job, but also extremely collaborative, bringing people in, and the development of that area um, is due in no small part to Meng Zing's work on behalf of us all. And I thank you for that. Um, I also want to highlight that Meng Zing is one of our teaching stalwarts. Now, as a head of department and director of studies before that, I get to see all the good things in the department, but I also get all the little niggles. And there has never once been a little niggle in any of Meng Zing's teaching, his assessment, his pastoral care, um, his timeliness, his responsiveness to things relating to those. Um, that's just because he is an excellent individual, an excellent academic, a fantastic colleague. He's also served in different capacities. Um, I recall very early on in the department, as quite a junior academic, he was tasked with revamping totally our master's program. That was quite a daunting task. He did a great job, and so obviously, as a result of that, he's been given many other significant jobs since then, including uh, Director of Undergraduate Studies, um, which he delivered brilliantly on behalf of our students and our staff, of course. Um, and um, I, I think that his most recent role um, is one that most of you won't have heard of. It's called the Academic Load Champion. I think that's what we called it. Um, and what does that mean? That means he's looking out in a transparent way to make sure that we are fair in our allocation of roles and of teaching, um, that we serve the purposes of the university, of the department, of the students effectively, um, and that we somehow work towards reducing overall load so that we can be better at everything that we do. And Meng Zing has done that diligently, I don't know, for the past three years, um, has created this role from nothing. And, and thank you for that. Certainly, uh, Professor Meng Zing Tang's um, activities in teaching, research, service, um, collegiality, and his evident international esteem more than justify his elevation to professor, which was in 2019 before the pandemic, 
Uh, so I'm glad we can actually finally come together and celebrate in this way. So Meng Singh, over to you uh, to give us your inaugural lecture. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's so great to see uh, you face to face. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, and also thank you for those who are watching online. I know there are people watching online. Um, and also, before I start, I really want to extend also my thanks to the organization team. Uh, really, I, I can only name a few, but Rebecca, Kemi, Sam, uh, there's uh, the AV team, really very much appreciate you made this uh, possible. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to um, start uh, to talk a little bit about myself. So I actually, um, I was told if I use this, then the online people use the cursor, online um, um, people can see this as well. So I actually grew up in the, uh, near the city called Xi'an. Uh, in Shanxi province uh, in China. Uh, so this was me. Um, and uh, that's my parents and my brother. And uh, uh, so my parents couldn't, uh, they couldn't be here. And they really want to watch online, but it's really just too late. So I persuaded them, I told them I will uh, actually go through with the recording with them afterwards. So, um, um, so coming back to the uh, city, so Xi'an is actually a, a city that's well known for its terracotta army, if uh, some of you know it. Um, so the first Chinese emperor who wanted to protect him after, in his afterlife with his armies. And there's also uh, one of the best preserved uh, ancient city wall in there. Uh, they also have lots of really, really nice cuisine. So this, I show this uh, dish, the noodle, not only because it has unique shape, the shape looks like a belt, um, but also it has a really unique name. So this is a character for this noodle. Uh, this is the most complicated Chinese character, at least as far as I am aware. <laughs> uh, and uh, it sounds biang. Uh, apparently it's the sound when it was made. Um, so uh, also Xi'an is a city I met my wife Li, who is sitting there, and uh, uh, with my two boys. So I moved to um, Leicester in 1999, uh, 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 and then a few years uh, after that to Oxford, that's where Jack was born. Uh, and then uh, in 2006, that, uh, I moved to London to Imperial College, that's uh, where Leo was born. Um, so this was me when I just joined the college. Uh, this actually is a picture on my college CID <laughs> card. Uh, and this was me several years later when there was a proper photo shoot uh, by the college. And this was me uh, just, um, yeah, spoil the difference. Um, okay, medical vision. Um, so before uh, the medical imaging technology came around, really the only way you can see inside a human body is to cut them open, right? But we have the wonderful technology of X-ray imaging, uh, 1895, and then I'm showing you here two actually images. This is an early image of an ultrasound image of a baby in the womb, and this is one of the early images of the CT of a human head. So this wonderful technology has become a lot more sophisticated in the past decades, and you can see this like MRI, uh, this uh, PET CT ultrasound, and lots of other technologies. Right? They produce these really remarkable images of intricate uh, details of human, uh, inside the human body, the anatomy, the uh, function. Um, but we still have still lots of challenges, uh, despite all the advances. Uh, the cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurological disease, they are still the leading cause of death, uh, uh, premature death um, in the world. And also we have lots of challenges uh, in terms of healthcare delivery. We want to actually have more precise uh, delivery of uh, health care. We want to actually more customize the treatment, more customize, say, to individuals. Also, we want the, them to be delivered at the right time and the right place. So even if you have a wonderful technology, but if you can't move them to, say, the operating theater, to the patient bedside, or to uh, an ambulance, 
then it means some patient won't be able to benefit from that, right? And also patient experience and uh, uh, um, quality of life is important. But really another one of the most important challenging healthcare is the cost. So affordability is also very important. So um, I want to kind of show you a few specific challenges in here in clinical challenge where actually we're, we're interested. One is in surgery. So in surgery, um, the surgeon often face the choice of to cut or not to cut. So it's really a balance where if you cut too little, then the disease, for example, cancer could come back, right? But if you cut too much, you might actually do extra harm to the patient and cause serious side effect. So that's a significant challenge. Another challenge is about therapeutic prognosis or, or monitoring. So if you, it's really a significant uh, challenge in cancer where you, you really want to predict early whether your treatment, the patient is responding to your treatment, right? So that you can either stop the treatment if it's not responding, because often the treatment are quite toxic, or uh, and change them to other treatment um, before it's too late. So that's a big challenge. And another challenge is in the uh, cardiovascular system. The coronary artery disease is still the biggest killer in the Western uh, world. But up to 40% of the patient actually have microvascular disease. Their major arteries actually are fine. They have microvascular disease. But all the imaging technology are looking at really micro, uh, micro vessels, so the big vessels. And there is very, very limited tool to look at the micro vessels in the, in the heart. So that's another challenge that um, um, I will come back to a bit later. So, I mean, I can tell you all day about how wonderful <coughs> ultrasound imaging is. It's broadly used uh, in the clinic already. It's, you can see it's super portable and accessible. It's a bedside point of care technology. And it's affordable, safety, superb safety record. And I'll show you very soon they have very high, it can have very high spatial and temporal resolution. And it can provide functional information. So really, oh, sorry. So they're already integrated at every step of the way in the clinic, in the patient pathway, like from detection, diagnosis, the different stage of treatment, uh, um, and afterwards, okay? Right, so the, the, the name of the talk is uh, sound and uh, bubbles, so I need to talk about sound, ultrasound. What is ultrasound? It is a mechanical wave. Uh, you can show this, uh, you can see this uh, movie. It, it's a mechanical wave that's at high frequencies. You can't hear it with your ear, but you generate it with a piston or ultrasound transducer, and then in ultrasound imaging, all you do is you, you generate a, a, a small wave, a pulse, a short pulse, you fire them, you just listen to the echo. How long the echo come back from an object will tell you the depth of that object. And if you can focus your wave and sweep laterally, you know the lateral position of the object, right? So this actually has already been used in the nature. So, so in the bats um, and in dolphins, they use this principle to, to hunt their prey. Uh, I showed you this early image of the baby, and now you can see, I mean, ultrasound has really come a long way, and you can see the kind of the excellent clinical images already to show uh, the kind of the details of the organ, inside organ, without opening them up, right? And also the dynamic information about the blood flow. Right, uh, that's sound bit, now the bubble bit. When we say bubble, you probably were thinking about this. But bubbles can also be used for actually uh, uh, enhancing ultrasound images. So uh, this image in here, uh, you're looking at this micro bubble in a micrograph next to some red blood cells. So you can see they're tiny. And a unique property of them is that they can interact with sound. This, this is a, a movie uh, taken uh, at very high frame rate, actually by a, a collaborator, Rob Exley, uh, who is sitting here. Uh, so the bubbles oscillate on the ultrasound. So it, gave, it can give you a really efficient, it, it's an efficient contrast agent that can give you strong signal that you can detect. So modern scanner can detect the individual bubble of microns in size. So it's really the sensitivity. It has lots of nice properties, safety. It can be switched off uh, because bubble can pop. I can I'll touch on that later. But the sensitive, you can image them very sensitively and specifically for, uh, so basically if you introduce them into the blood flow, 
then you can actually uh, see everywhere in the body. Um, so for the rest of my talk, I will really focus on this blood flow imaging. So why is blood flow important? So blood flow is vital actually for tissue function, right? The tissue needs this uh, nutrient that provided by blood flow. And uh, having the capability of Im imaging blood flow will give you a kind of a, a very valuable or complementary information about the, t the functional status of the tissue, right? So, and also we know this blood flow is closely related. So there are altered blood flow in many diseases, like in atherosclerosis, so that's really the disease causing the uh, stroke or the heart attack, and also in cancer, where we know in cancer that because the cancer need, really need to grow fast, they recruit a lot of new vessels in the so-called angiogenesis process. So blood flow is really important, and currently there are limited ways to imaging them. And so this microbubble have already been broadly used in the clinic. Uh, and uh, day in, day out, it's, it's been already approved. These are some clinical images of a liver. So on the left-hand side is a structure, conventionally called a brightness mode or B-mode image, and on the right-hand side is a blood flow microbubble-specific image. You can see the tumor in here, and in here, indicated by the arrow that you just can't see in the structure imaging. Right, so that's just one example. Okay. So we already have some pretty good vision using this uh, ultrasound, but can we actually do better? I will talk about first in time and in space. Uh, the, the first one is ultra-fast imaging. So what's, um, how can we generate ultra-fast vision? So the traditional way of generating ultrasound is you transmit a pulse with the transducer along the line of sight, you receive the echo, you build one line of image. And then you just repeat this process until this full image is generated, right? But if you, uh, with the modern advance of the electronics and the computing power, actually what we can do is using the transducer to generate an unfocused wave, like in this case a plane wave, and receive all the signal from the transducer elements. There could be a hundred or more. And then we can actually build the uh, uh, reconstruct the image using computers. And that means instead of a line of an image per transmission, now you have a full image per transmission. That basically means your frame rate is suddenly increased by two orders of magnitude. We're talking about tens of thousands of frames per second up to that, uh, depending on the depths. So that is really fast, but how can we make use of that? So this is a, a vessel with positive blood flow. So this is a conventional technology called ultrasound Doppler. The color really tells you where there's blood flow and also the direction of them. But you, you can see there's something going on, but really not much. But if we use the, the ultra-fast imaging with, combined with the contrast agent, this is the same vessel, but you can see so much more. You can see the intricate detail of this flow, and you can actually use your, uh, the, you can use your eye to track them, and you can use a computer to track them and quantify the flow too. And uh, this is the, um, uh, also a, uh, uh, viralization of the flow in uh, uh, rapid abdominal aorta. You can see the complex uh, complexity <laughs> of the flow at different phase. Uh, I show some picture on the right-hand side corner. Those are really the people who uh, have been leading the, uh, doing the work and leading the work. I, there's lots of more people in every study. I couldn't list them, but I list some. So I hope you forgive me if you, uh, uh, you, uh, I haven't listed everyone here. Um, this kind of blood flow information will be really useful, for example, in the research of atherosclerosis because we know that it's related to blood flow and uh, many other things. We also applied this very fast imaging with a contrast agent to the heart. And this is actually a conventional line-by-line -line scanning. You can see these bubbles inside the chamber. You see this uh, heart wall. Um, and uh, you see some information, you can see how it pumps, but with this ultra-fast imaging, you can see so much more. Um, and uh, this is a slow play of this uh, movie. Because we're acquiring fast, we can actually slow down the motion. Um, and also inside the chamber, you can actually do this so-called uh, ultrasound imaging flow symmetry to basically to track the flow and quantify them. Actually, there are studies to show the pattern of this flow in the heart 
is actually related to the cardiac function. So this could be a potential diagnostic uh, tool. Um, but if we look at, we talked about the challenge about looking at microvessels in the, in the heart, right? So if we look at the conventional technology of, the, uh, of this image in the, in the heart wall, you don't really see much. But if you look at the, uh, if you look at the ultra-fast imaging, just, just to zoom in, so this is a slow version of that. But you can see there are lots of bubbles moving around in the myocardium. Those are the microvessels. Those are the microvessels in the myocardium that is of interest. And really, this technology offers a potential tool to be able to investigate this microvessel in the heart wall that otherwise couldn't be investigated. OK, um, so you really need to bear with me uh, um, um, as I'm a noodle fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but uh, I really like this email. I can assure you that not everyone makes noodle like this back in China. Um, but this is a wonderful picture. It's actually by BBC. Um, but what I also want to draw your attention to the, some features of the image. So there are part of the image that's very clear, but part of the image that's quite blurred. So this is a two-dimensional image, but from this image, because of the blurriness, you can actually infer the third dimension, which is time. Right? You know this object are moving uh, as a time. So actually, we want to use this in our ultrasound imaging, because in ultrasound imaging, a challenge is uh, most of the imaging is really in 2D imaging. We can image over time, but actually the third dimension, for example, the flow, blood flow, is really in, third di in three dimension. But we, we most of the time can only image two. How do we? Uh, take the information from the dimension we already have and infer the other. So this, the image you're looking at is actually a cross-section of a vessel going into the plan, right? So when nothing moves in there, then you will get a still image over time. But if there is a flow, even in the third dimension, you can see actually things are changing. So what using this information to infer how the flow work, uh, is in the third dimension, <coughs> so through the plan. So that's what we did. Uh, actually, Xiaobei was leading the work, but also in collab uh, lots of the work in here is in collaboration with Peter, who is also sitting somewhere uh, in his, his lab. And, uh, and uh, we actually generated this. So what I'm showing through the movie, the, the vessel is going upside down, so up and down. And we are imaging a plan, but we can figure out the, uh, the uh, flow velocity in the third dimension like this. So this is really a spatially and temporary resolved three-dimensional flow information. But with a, a conventional probe, we don't need a very sophisticated 3D probe. OK, um, so this is another study. Um, so you can see sometimes this ultrasound image, some people don't really like ultrasound image. They kind of feel like it's noisy. Indeed, sometimes ultrasound images are noisy. Um, but so Antonio and uh, um, uh, the uh, co-worker, they actually trying to look at how we can reduce the noise. We, we, we gave this a name called ASAP. We're quite happy with the name. Uh, and uh, uh, what it does, is if you're looking at a target that is giving you echo, right, you can have a single set of sensor and you can just sense what's going on. You can focus it, you can image it. But if you have a second set of sensor that's independent of the first, and then what you can do is you can compare these two sensors through this cross-correlation process, and then whatever is common, that is a signal, will be enhanced. But whatever that is not common, so the noise actually are specific to the individual sensor group and their electronics, can be suppressed. So that's what we did. Um, so this is the transducer aperture. It's split into two. You can also interleave the two group. And you do the cross-correlation. This is the only mass equation I show in here. And it's simple. It's really just a multiply and sum, right? And then you will be able to actually generate images that, so this is, I'll show you some results in here. Uh, so this is a conventional, like a B-mode image of this uh, rabbit kidney. Um, and this is really the state of the art. It's already using all the ultra-fast data that you already generated to figure out the, where the vessel are. It's a wonderful image, but you can see the background, there's still lots of noise. We know like if your noise level is high and some subtle 
but valuable information could be lost uh, in, in the diagnosis or clinical uh, use, right? But this is the ASAP, where you can see the noise has been significantly suppressed, and he also generated uh, this wonderful movie. Uh, so this is a real-time display of, the, actually it's a super real-time, you can see it's very slow because we're imaging very fast, right? Um, the uh, the uh, um, uh, microvascular color tells you which direction the flow is going. We also actually apply this to, to cancer model. So this is a cancer model. And uh, uh, in cancer, one thing that's really uh, quite interests a lot of people is the heterogeneity of the, of the cancer. You can see in the traditional BMO structure image, you really don't see, you see a very, quite a, a homogeneous region in the cancer. But if you look at this ASAP microvascular image, there's a remarkable heterogeneity in it, which would really could help us to understand the cancer and potentially better treat it. So now we really, um, we're talking about, uh, we talked about time, like really how fast we can, we can do and how that can help us improve the image quality. Now we're really talking about spatial space now, the spatial resolution. So the conventional Doppler technique is really in the kind of the resolution is in millimeter. I mean, it's, it's already pretty okay, but uh, it, with the ultrafast ultrasound and the bubbles, you really have very high signal to noise ratio, much higher than before. So you can really push the kind of the resolution to, to near its limits, the so-called diffraction limits. Um, but really, realistically, we're talking about hundreds of microns, maybe uh, one, depending on the depths, uh, one to 200 microns. Uh, um, but we really want to go much further. So this is uh, what we would call a super-resolution ultrasound localization microscopy. Right. Um, as always, you, you, you got ideas from, from really somewhere else. So this is actually originated from optics. So um, what I'm showing you here is actually um, in optics, they have figured out a way to switch on and off some contrast agent that labels the cell. Right? So if you switch them on and off individually, you make them blink. You can see the blinking. And then you can actually, for each of these um, uh, uh, switched on agents, they can pinpoint his center, and then they can kind of accumulate it over time. Then you will generate a really nice super resolution image comparing on the left hand side the conventional image. So this is a subject of a uh, uh, Nobel Prize in 2014 in chemistry. And really the, the key in here is you need to switch on and off individual agents and you just need to localize the center and then you need to accumulate, okay? So really the question is, how can we do this in ultrasound? But before uh, I move to ultrasound, I really want to kind of give you an uh, example just to explain a bit about why this process can generate you super resolution image. So I use our map, uh, the wonderful Google map as an example. So you, you can probably recognize we are, well, probably somewhere here, and this is Royal Albert Hall, the Kensington uh, Garden. Uh, let's say we are interested in these two roles. We want to image them, we want to properly separate them, right? And, um, um, but if you have an average camera, you, you, you know the name of the role, this is uh, uh, Prince Consul role, this is uh, Imperial College role, right? <laughs> so if you have an ordinary camera, and if you are imaging it really far away in the sky, very, very far away, the image you can get could be like this. So it's, you just don't see uh, the road you want to see, right? So let's just zoom into here. So that's the two roads of interest. Uh, let's assume that there are lots of cars on the road, right? So how can we actually resolve this from far away with the ordinary camera? The idea is we can actually, at least we can image at night and assuming everything else is dark, then at least you get rid of the background, right? And then you can turn on the headlight of the car. If you turn on one, you can see the car is very small, but because your imaging resolution is really blurred, right? It's a blob. But what you can do 
um, if you turn on every car's headlight, this will be, you can see that there are probably is road in there, but you don't know how many roads are there uh, and uh, what's the shape of the road, okay, if you, you do that. But if you turn them all off and just selectively turn on two, and that's a two car, and uh, you, you, ooh, you have the two image, and because you know they're coming from individual cars, so you can actually pinpoint their center, and that will localize the two points, and that will be two points on your super resolution map. And all you need to do is to turn them off and turn another on, and you localize it. That's the third point on your localization map. You just keep doing this. Another two cars, pinpoint their center, and two more points. You just accumulate this, and in the end, you can generate this super resolution map, but with the ordinary camera, okay? Right, so this is about like more than 10 years ago, actually, Rob Axley and Chris Dunsby, both of them sitting here, they came to me and really with this question, can we do this using ultrasound and bubbles? And um, we just decided to give it a try. So Kirsten and Olivia, they were the first two research students who worked on this project. And uh, so this is a vessel. So we have the vessel, that's kind of our road. Uh, and we have bubbles, that's our cars. But really, instead of packing the bubbles in there and turning them on and off, we can't do that. But we can make the bubble flow because in blood vessel, everything flows, right? So you can see this bubble moving around. And all you do is to detect them and point their center. And then you will generate this super resolution image of the vessel and we verified it's the right size, and then we also show that we can detect two, these are two cross-sections of the two, very close, where you see the red haze, that is the conventional ultrasound, that's the kind of diffraction-limited ultrasound, so we are in increasing the resolution by quite a lot. This is actually, so Kirsten and Richard uh, have um, really uh, pushed this to in vivo demonstration. This is a mouse ear, where we put in the contrast agent, and then we just uh, uh, localize them, and then in the end accumulate, you can generate this really nice uh, microvascular images. And uh, just to say this is the first ever demonstration of this super resolution in vivo. Uh, and uh, we chose the mouse here because we have the ground truth, uh, not because it's easy. <laughs> um, and also, because there's a very nice thing about these moving bubbles, because not only you can pinpoint their center, but for the same bubble, because they, they appear at different frames, you can track them. So if you can track these bubbles, then you can actually generate more than the morphology of the vessel. And you can actually, besides the morphology, you can work out their velocity. So this is a map of the speed, and this is a map of the same vasculature, same data set of the flow direction. Now you can, you can, uh, um, work out. These are all new, very new info, information that has never really been, been able to be visualized in the past. Um, so really the process is you acquire your data. Uh, after detection, you really need to find the individual ones. You localize them, you, you track them, and you will generate the final image. OK, so on our spectrum, resolution spectrum, now we're really moving all the way down to close to cellular level. There are studies to really to show that 10 micron or below is, is, is uh, achievable under certain conditions. who are really kind of at a different order of magnitude in resolution improvement. So this is a work done by uh, Jia Qi with Savan and uh, again collaborating with, uh, with Peter, uh, uh, his group. And uh, this is the lymph nodes imaging. So why are we introducing, why are we interested in uh, lymph nodes? Lymph nodes, I mean, lymphatic system in the body is really a recycling system, right? It's really important, but also it's a very important route for cancer metastasis. So lots of cancer just uh, spread through the lymph nodes. So we want to really look at this lymph node. But this is a rapid lymph node, it's a healthy one. So this is a conventional imaging where we basically just scan through uh, uh, 2D plans of the lymph node. So this is a node, uh, and uh, this is really what you can see uh, in the zoom. But if we put in the contrast agent and we do the kind of the turning off the light bit, so basically remove the tissue, then you can see these bubbles moving around in this lymphatic vessel. 
You can localize them to generate the morphology of these vessels, and you can also track them, so you generate these velocity maps. And you, we also demonstrated that we can separate really very closely uh, spaced structures um, by doing this super resolution. Um, so we demonstrated the feasibility, um, but really we want to, uh, uh, we have lots of challenges we want to address, right? So the challenges about tissue motion, the challenges about um, bubble tracking, and uh, slow acquisition, I'll, I'll go through them quickly one by one. So for tissue motion, I mean, we're accumulating over time, so anything that's moving will be a problem for us, right? So this is actually a clinical acquisition on a, uh, a lower limb of a volunteer. So that's the, the structure image, that's the uh, contrast image. You probably can see the, there's even a muscle twitch in there. So there, we thought the lower limb wouldn't move. Actually, they do move a lot. So this is a, um, a work done uh, led by Savan, where this is before the motion correction. The motion is only in hundreds of microns, but it matters to us. And this is a, um, uh, after the motion correction. And we also showed in this study that it's really important to correct motion because a single vessel, this is after the motion correction, can be viewed as two vessels if you don't correct for them because things are moving around, right? So it's really important for motion correction. Um, also, we have challenges on bubble tracking. If you just think about maybe tracking um, these bubbles like people, when there are lots of people and when, you, when you're taking pictures every now and then not very fast, then people might move very far away. It just, it's re really challenging to track them, right? So, so here, uh, the example is like this. Two bubbles in the first frame. One might go to here, one might go to there, but if you are slow, you really might not be able to pair it properly. Um, so there's ambiguity. And also, for bubbles, there are extra challenge. For, for humans, they probably won't disappear, but for our bubbles, uh, they can pop, right? They can disappear. And new bubbles can come in because it's a 2D imaging. They can come in from off plan. So there are lots of challenges. So, so Ji Peng actually worked with our collaborator in Zhejiang University. Um, he has developed a global optimization uh, framework, really incorporate this so-called Kalman motion model. So it's really simple. It's basically it says, if you already have a pair, and then you can use this model to predict what the likely position where this bubble will go in the next frame. That can help us do the tracking, right? And also, there's multiple image features. He's incorporated, like if the bubble looks like this in this frame, it probably won't change too much in the next frame. So if you do that, he actually uh, um, generated this. So this is the accumulation of the microvasculature in a mouse brain. And uh, you can see that the, the localization and the tracking is actually uh, uh, working pretty well. In the end, you can also generate the velocity map. So this is a velocity map of the, of the brain. And he also showed that uh, with the new tracking uh, 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 framework, you actually do improve the results significantly. Okay, so um, we also talk about the challenge. We talk about the challenge of motion. We talk about the, the challenge we're facing about tracking. But there's another challenge is really currently you need to accumulate for quite a long time before uh, we can generate uh, a decent super resolution image. You need to accumulate to track. Um, and uh, if you remember uh, in the uh, in the, just now, I talked about the optical imaging where they actually switch on and off this contrast agent. So they can do it very quickly because they can quickly switch them on and off. But in our uh, bubble imaging so far, we don't really have a way to switch the bubble on once they are injected they're on. So we kind of have to rely on them to flow past. And if the flow is slow in like the, the small vessels or micro vessels, we will have a problem, right? We will have to wait. So that's, that's, so if we can find some contrast agent that we can actually switch on, <coughs> excuse me, acoustically and switch them off, then we could potentially speed things up. So quite a number of people have, we worked with our collaborators uh, in Oxford and, uh, and also in Arizona, uh, um, Terry, to, to look at this 
a phase change contrast agent. So I'm going to show you a movie where these agents are switched on by acoustics. Uh, you can see this initially, they're not visible in the optics, but also uh, they're not visible in the ultrasound. I can show you. So this is a, the agents are already in this flow phantom, but actually this is done by material. It just turn on, and then you can see this bubble flowing around in this, uh, in this uh, vessel. So we can definitely turn them on. Uh, and this is a uh, in vivo uh, work where we turn on everywhere, and you can see it's just like a light bulb uh, uh, switched on. Um, so, right, I want to make a pause here. I've been in research for more than 25 years, and I think I really feel like this is a very, very rare occasion where I can say my research is awesome. <laughs> without being perceived as um, arrogant. So acoustic wave, sparsely activated localization microscopy, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I think this passed the ASAP a little bit. Um, right, so how does it work? Uh, so actually girl working with um, a group of people, um, um, so they actually try to do this in vitro first. So this is the two vessels um, and uh, Basically, we just uh, try to switch on and off this contrast agent. So now we have an agent we can switch on. We can also switch them off because we can use ultrasound to pop them, right? So if you switch them on and off, you can generate, we show that a super resolution image uh, that can resolve structures that otherwise are not uh, resolved. Um, and also Kai uh, moves this to in vivo demonstration. So this is the rabbit kidney where you can see every now and then there's a flash in the image. That's the generation of the new contrast agent uh, because of the uh, switching. And then we can generate this um, uh, density, this velocity, and this direction map of this um, uh, uh, kidney microvasculature. So Kai has really um, he has done a lot uh, in this um, uh, in this study. He showed these wonderful images, but also he really uh, the key thing here is it showed that we resolve the vessel much, much better than the conventional, well, this is not conventional, this is a state-of-the-art microvascular imaging technology, and you can see the difference. And also what is really important is these images uh, uh, require the data acquisition of only a few seconds, rather than the tens of seconds or, or minutes that's um, often um, required for the current imaging. So that's a really a major, major achievement. And because we have this, we can track them, we have this dynamic information. So we actually can display them in a dynamic way. So these are really showing you in a dynamic way how this blood flow is going because it's a real blood flow, right? And um, uh, also, because we can do it really fast, I mean, we need to push it a bit so the image resolution is not as good, but this is really the first ever demonstration of real-time uh, super resolution uh, in an in vivo uh, uh, object. And you can see this. It is done in real time, but in super, in super localization manner. Right. Okay, another benefit of this awesome <laughs> technology Every time I, I refrain myself from um, yeah, being very happy. Um, another actually unique uh, uh, thing about this awesome is that you can select where you want to image. Basically, because you are turning on, you can focus your ultrasound to turn on this, this agent at a particular region. So we actually give it a try where this is uh, in here on the left, and this is like everything at the bottom, and this is if we only turn on the agent on the right-hand side. And then you can see we can generate really this very specific vascular network that is specific to the region of what you have uh, activated, right? So, so this also will be really nice. We, we, we were really thinking about how this can be used, for example, in, in looking at the coronary artery disease. We are currently, uh, if you inject this, this is non-invasively, you can kind of activate them, and you can, you can kind of study the downstream branch of this specific coronary artery, right? So that's a possibility. Um, 
OK. Um, the next challenge is the 3D one. <laughs> so like I said, most of our imaging is in 2D. 3D is really uh, challenging, but we, we actually have generated our, this is the very recent results, uh, uh, with our 3D probe. So you can see this is a probe. It's a quite small probe. Uh, it's a matrix array, lots of sensor. You can see a thousand sensor in there, and it can um, image um, in, in uh, 3D, like in this volume in here. But bear in mind, this is more than a thousand sensor. Normally, our 2D uh, imaging transducer, that's a linear array, only have a, maybe a hundred sensor or so, right? So this is a really a lot more complex in terms of the hardware, transducer and, and everything else. But this is the image. That's, so basically we image, we super localize, we track, and this is the image Jipeng actually generated. And uh, if you look very carefully, this is a 3D image, but it's also a movie. If you look very carefully, you can see there are lots of dots moving around. Every of the dots in there is a micro bubble. So basically, you're looking at this micro bubble just moving around in a 3D microvasculature. Um, but like I said, this is really complex technology, um, quite uh, expensive, computationally demanding. Uh, and also, it has a very small field of view. It's only one, about one square centimeter at the moment. Um, so it's not really um, sufficient for many of the organs we want to investigate. So this is, um, uh, again, a recent study that is to use a very specific type of transducer called row column array. I won't go into the detail of this, but really they basically have two orthogonal type of line sensors in there. So instead of like 1,000 elements, or in this case, it could be 10,000 elements if you want to cover the whole area, they only have 256 independent elements because they are rows and columns. But you can still do 3D imaging. Um, we, we need to actually, uh, I, when I said it's simple, um, but actually the, uh, the <coughs> researcher at Qingyuan and Zhou, uh, and they actually spend lots of time to improve the image quality. But now we have, if we can make this work, this field of view will be several times larger than the one we just saw. Okay? So, and we also were using this for awesome. Um, and uh, so, um, this are the, our very initial results where you're looking at already the bubbles activated by the previous pulse uh, activation, but then you can watch the next activation where you see the activation coming and you see these bubbles moving around in 3D space. And this is a two view of the same organ, right? And then you can actually localize and build this 3D microvascular network with this data. This is our very initial results, but we're, we're really happy. The field of view is several times larger than before, and the complexity is four times less. So this is really, really uh, uh, important for clinical translation. So uh, finally, on my 3D imaging, um, we have this, so basically, I want to uh, draw your attention, so this is really led by Bingxue, who is also sitting there. Um, I, I want to um, show you the difference between the, the X-ray CT and the more conventional chest X-ray. So you, if you look at these two images, the X-ray CT is slices, right? If you want to do 3D, you slice by slice, you have very accurate information on that slice for each 2D image. But chest X-ray is only a single 2D image, right? But it has all the information. It actually has all the volumetric information. It's just kind of uh, projected in one direction, so something are overlapping over others, right? But you capture the volumetric information in, um, uh, in that way. But one key difference between these two technology is that chest X-ray CT is much, much less complex and a lot cheaper. Right? So really the idea is now the 3D imaging is really challenging. Can we actually take some inspiration from this uh, concept? So currently our ultrasound imaging, if you're imaging 2D ultrasound imaging, then you really you focus the beam into a, a, a kind of a slice, right? So that's what we do. But in here, actually, the idea is we don't do focus. If we don't do focusing, then actually you are sensing the whole volume uh, under the transducer. And if you're sensing it, of course, I mean, your signal will become a little bit 
uh, not uh, um, as good, but we can do post processing uh, to, to recover that. And also bear in mind, we're doing super resolution, so there are single, um, um, there are single scatterers in there for us to look at. So uh, Bing Xu has done some simulation, uh, and he clearly show the conventional 2D imaging only show a little bit. Am I running out of time? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll be really quick. And the VIP SR, so we, yeah, this is another name we're quite happy with, volumetric image projection. And we can show the full volume, volumetric information compared to the standard 3D. Um, and also this is our very initial uh, in vivo data where you can see that we capture the volumetric information, but look at the complexity of the element. This is 32 fold less complex than in this case, but we still generated volumetric information. I promise this is the last noodle image <laughs> I'll show you. But I hope you agree with me, we have some wonderful technologies here, but are they really uh, useful? How can we prove they are useful? So these are really some ongoing collaborations. These are really very, very preliminary study. But we are, we are looking at uh, distinguishing, for example, using the super resolution map to distinguish between the malignant and uh, uh, benign lesion. Uh, and we have shown in a very s small number that there is some very significant difference between some fine vascular features. So you can use that to uh, distinguish. This is another uh, study led by Megan in collaboration with ICR, where if you remember, we have this um, challenge on therapeutic prognosis. So really, uh, there's, uh, we want to predict whether things are working or not at the early stage. So we only, this is uh, just um, uh, starting and we got a few uh, data, but really what you're looking at is a super resolution uh, microvascular image of a breast cancer before the radiotherapy and uh, two weeks after and uh, 12 months after. You can clearly see that the tumor is, uh, is gone in 12 months, but really the trick is we want to look at this pre-RT and two weeks after and really to find the feature that can predict the 12 months. That is the key. So the, this is ongoing uh, and uh, well, we, we hope to get some uh, results very soon. And we also have nice um, MRI image as contrast. The last one is, uh, if you remember, I also talked about to cut or not to cut challenge, right? So we're also working on that. So every year, there are many tens of thousands of breast cancer patients in the UK got their armpit lymph nodes cut off just as precaution, but found majority of them don't have disease, so they really shouldn't be cut off. But there's no choice, because we don't know until we cut off, cut them off whether there's disease or not. But what we're trying to do is to really f to generate uh, a, a tool that we can actually non-invasively tell whether there's a problem in the nose or not. So this is the uh, conventional B mode with this bubble moving around, and these are all very, very initial data by material moving system to the hospital, and we generate the super resolution, and this is zoom in. So we have lots of features in there. Really hope we can correlate that with histology or pathology finding, and we can, we can um, move this. So oh, I hope you agree with me. Ultrasound is a wonderful technology, superb resolution and uh, can visualize microflow functional information at microscopic level, um, and we're trying to address some clinical challenges. There are so many more research uh, that I haven't really mentioned in here, but I'll just very briefly, we worked, there's uh, work on uh, imaging using light and sound uh, in collaboration with quite a few people uh, um, uh, in here, uh, and also the wonderful PhD students, and again, uh, this bubble-related work, lots of work I, I don't have time to mention, but really this wonderful group members, postdocs and PhD students, and more recently a collaboration with Earth Science Engineering about uh, ultrasound tomography of the brain. I have omitted a lot of collaboration and other work, but these are really, I really want to thank uh, everyone, past and current members of the group. Um, without you, uh, I, I won't be here. Thank you very much, and my 
uh, acknowledgement to the collaborator. I'm sure I missed some out, really sorry. Um, and uh, founding body, thank you. Uh, very little from me. It's my pleasure to introduce the vote of thanks. And for a lecture like this, uh, one person won't be sufficient. So um, um, I will introduce Eleanor Stride, Professor of Biomaterials at Oxford, uh, Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, OB for Services to Engineering in 2021, and a longtime collaborator and friend of Meng Singh, and Robert Eckersley as well, who is also a longtime collaborator. I note with, uh, with interest that um, your top four most highly cited papers, um, Robert's a co, co uh, co-author on them. So obviously uh, two wonderful people for the vote of thanks. So I invite you both up. Thank you very much. So we realize we have the very unenviable task, uh, not only of following an amazing lecture, but also standing between you and the bar. Um, so we will keep this very, very short. Um, but we do just want to thank all of you for coming, Imperial for this, but most of all, Meng Zeng for being um, a superb collaborator. So as Anthony's already said, we've had the pleasure of working with you for nearly 20 years, I think we worked out. Mm. Um, but also, most importantly, being a friend over that period, and I hope for the foreseeable future. Um, our job is to confirm once and for all that you, not only you and your research are both absolutely awesome. <laughs> and I'm going to hand over to Rob for the last words. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, I first met Meng Jing about 20 years ago, I think. I was trying to work it out, but it's about 20 years ago. And I quickly realised him and I were both postdocs finding our way in this complicated academic field. Um, I quickly realized that Meng Jing was going to make a great collaborator. He was meticulous. He was generous with his ideas. He was very good at bullying me into writing up my results and getting those papers published. And so I saw in him some, somebody that would help me, somebody that was worth sticking with. And Thank you for that. We, we spent many years very happily collaborating together. And since it's a vote of thanks, I want to thank Meng Jing for some other things. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your kindness. And thank you for when I made the decision to leave this field, being the one person that challenged me to make sure I was making the right choice. I really appreciate that. I know that you are an awesome professor. Um, I know, I never doubted it, and I am very, very proud to have known you. Thank you for being my lifelong friend. For some bubbles. <laughs>